Hello, everybody, and welcome to the videos for week seven. So we'll be moving into chapter five. We're going to finish, chapter, do all of chapter five this week, um, talking about thermochemistry and starting in on heat. Uh, so before we get started, I do just want to say that next week we will be doing test two. Um, so test two will cover all the topic from chapter four. So that goes back to before spring break um, and then everything we've done since then. Uh, it'll, there won't be any explicit questions about early material, but, you know, I won't explicitly ask you things about, you know, what ion is this going to form or what is metric units, but I, there will be metric units on the test. Uh, so I do hope that, you know, anything like that, that we've used since then, right, we've still named things, we still talked about ions, done reactions of ions, uh, interpreting molecular formulas. So it's going to be expected that you know how to do those things. Um, there's a review posted um, on uh, the extra in the extra review uh, problems on uh, on Blackboard on that folder where the reviews were previously. Um, you can submit that and upload it onto Blackboard uh, for five bonus points on the test. It can either be an image or a PDF, um, anything like that. Um, and you can uh, anything that just shows that you did it. Um, and I'll give you five points on your test because of that. Uh, the test will be administered on Blackboard. Um, how it's going to work is that I'll open the test on Sunday um, at noon, and you'll have until Tuesday at 11.55. So there won't be any lecture videos or anything like that the, that week uh, or for, at the beginning. We'll have them in, later in the week, but there won't be a Monday, Tuesday set of videos. Um, you're going to have two hours to complete the test once you start. So you have that whole time frame, that whole like two and a half days, to do it at any time that works best for you. But once you start the test, once you open that assignment, you only have two hours to finish it, two hours to complete it. Um, you're going to want to upload your work onto Blackboard within 30 minutes of submitting the test. Um, the kind of the reason here is one, to make sure you did the work um, and it'll give you 50% of your total test score. So if you just do the Blackboard assignments, which is going to grade you, you know, you'll get an answer right or wrong. Um, you'll be capped out at 50%. If you want the rest of it, you just need to upload some work. I also will assign partial credit. So there'll be problems that if you don't get the right answer, Blackboard would give you zero points. I will give you that partial credit based on the work that you upload. Again, this can be an image or a PDF. Um, I recommend if you have, you know, uh, on a smartphone, you can download apps that will turn images into PDFs. Um, those work really well. Um, that's what I use for whenever you've seen me upload work that's scanned. Or if you have a scanner, um, that'll also work too. All right. so. Related to the fact that question test two is coming up over test four and test five. Last week we talked about stoichiometry. And so we want to really be sure that we're very comfortable with doing stoichiometry. So let's get a little more practice in. Uh, so for participation assignment three, question one, what mass of O2 is required to completely react with 54.1 grams of NaH according to the following chemical equation? Uh, so the chemical equation below is 2NaH plus O2 becomes Na2O and H2O. And I've given you some molar masses for everything. I do want to note, uh, just like all these molar masses are given here, um, uh, when we're going to do uh, the test, I'm going to give you these molar masses. This is an example of, you know, in, on test one, I would have asked you, what is the molar mass? But here, I'm just going to give you all these molar masses, um, but I expect you to know how to use them because what we've talked about here and this uh, chapters four and five was, you know, how we use molar masses to do stoichiometry. Okay. So uh, moving into chapter five content um, with thermochemistry is what we want to be studying. So we want to just get some language defined. Um, we're going to start that we're doing uh, thermodynamics is the study of energy. Uh, basically, it's the study of energy and how we use it and how it changes. And so what we're going to be specifically interested in, interested in is thermochemistry. Um, so this would be looking at energy in the context of chemical systems. Um, you know, we've talked about these things before, the idea that when you have, say, a chemical reaction, you would get, whoopsies, you would get the effect of, say, heat. Chemical reactions, uh, say, release heat um, or uh, release heat and or uh, take out heat, right? So the fact that you have that change in heat uh, you know, fire is a sign of a chemical reaction. There's energy associated with that. Also, instant cold packs. When you run the cold pack, um, it becomes cold, and that's heat. There's energy moving around. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if you've driven recently, um, you know, the internal combustion engine of a car, there's a chemical reaction that's occurring inside the car 
And then the machine, the engine, turns that into much more usable, not just necessarily generic heat, but instead forward motion. So uh, what is energy uh, before we're going to be talking about? So energy is the capacity to do work. When we say work here, that actually has a technical meaning where it means you're making something happen. Um, there is uh, some sort of motion or some sort of change that doesn't want to naturally happen that you are making happen, like lifting something up, right? Generally, if you have, say, a book on a table, it's not gonna, just going to start floating. It requires work to make that happen. Um, so energy can come in two different uh, manifestations. We have kinetic energy and potential energy. So kinetic energy, that is energy of motion. So we say the capacity to do work. Well, in kinetic energy, that would be when we see change happening. Energy is actually uh, exchanging, moving, something, work is happening. So in this example over here, if you have, say, a water wheel, when the water flows over the top, the wheel starts to rotate. So that means the wheel is moving, and the water, is drive, using kinetic energy, is driving the motion of this wheel. So potential energy, then, is anything that is stored, anything that has the potential to cause changes. Um, so in this case, that would be the water that's up in the top, right? The water that is at a higher elevation, it's just higher up, can fall, um, and that falling of water can drive motion. Um, anything that is potential energy could be used in the future. It's not being used right now, but it can be used in the future. So in the context of chemistry, um, we have kind of two manifestations of where these types of energy show up. Our potential energy is the chemical energy that is stored in bonds, right? When you have bonds, those they're holding atoms together. We've talked about, uh, you know, back in chapter two, that that is an energetic motivation. The reason why uh, atoms come together and form molecules is because it's a lower energy state. Uh, it is more stable. Um, and so that energy has been saved and that energy is potential. When you do chemical reactions, that energy can be released and can change. So then kinetic energy is all about molecules in motion, right? Kinetic energy is there's an actual dynamic, something is changing. So in, mol in you know, any sort of sample of matter, solids, liquids, gases, our molecules are going to be moving, and that is where the kinetic energy comes from. So if you're moving, say, slowly here, not a lot of motion, that's lower kinetic energy, or you can, molecules can be moving a lot, and that would be higher kinetic energy. So when we talk about heat transfer and changes, or I'm sorry, energy transfer and changes of how energy is kind of dynamic or moving between systems. There's two primary ways that that happens, heat and work. We're going to be focused on heat in this chapter as we talk about it. And heat is defined as thermal energy motion. So that word thermal, we usually associate with heat. But thermal motion or thermal energy is energy associated with random motion. So this word random means is like if we look at this example here, all these molecules are just moving in various directions, right? They're all just kind of bouncing around. Doesn't really matter. There's no order to it. They're not all moving to the left or to the right. So thermal energy and thermal motion is all about random energy. And when you have higher thermal energy, there is molecules moving faster. They're moving faster, uh, moving over more distance, covering more space, those sorts of things. And when you have transfer of thermal energy as heat, um, that's always driven by temperature differences. So if you have a hot object that touches a cold object, energy, that motion of those molecules will transfer uh, from hot to cold. Work, on the other hand, is ordered motion. So this idea of ordered motion. It's still, in the case of a lot of times, going to be driven by molecules that are themselves moving randomly. But importantly, when you have work this process, you can see these molecules are moving every which way, kind of bouncing around. But this piston up top is moving up, right? It only moves up. It moves away. It's getting pushed by the gas going vertically. Um, unfortunately for us, work we won't be talking about here. You got to come back for Gen Chem 2 if you want to learn about Oh, and I do want to note, I forgot to mention this, the symbol for heat is going to be a lowercase q. So H will come up uh, later this week. Uh, it's reserved for something else. But q is lowercase q is going to be our symbol for heat. All right, so 
this thermal energy is molecules and atoms in motion. The fact that these molecules are just moving, any given molecule has some sort of motion, um, and that motion is inherently kinetic. And any sort of motion that we have is corresponds to thermal energy. So when you have high thermal energy, molecules are moving fast. When you have low thermal energy, they're not moving fast. The thing is, thermal energy is going to be unique to all of your different atoms and different molecules. So when we usually talk about it, we use temperature. So temperature is a single number that gives you an average thermal energy of molecules, right? We know based on, you know, talking about the mole that there are, you know, billions, trillions, quadrillions of atoms in a sample. And so what we really care about is kind of what the average thermal energy in that sample, some will be moving faster, some will be moving slower, but overall there's some sort of average speed. So if we have, on average, low thermal energy, like in this box, where these, mall, these balls aren't moving very much, they're moving around some, but certainly not as much as this high thermal energy. Right? These things are bouncing around, moving a lot faster, going over larger magnitudes. So that's higher thermal energy, which means that would have a higher temperature. Uh, colloquially, you know, we would say it's hot. Right? It feels hot because those molecules are really moving around a lot. Okay, so heat... Again, lowercase q is the transfer of thermal energy. Um, so thermal energy is motion, right? The fact that these molecules are moving. So what does that transfer look like? Well, what happens is when you have molecules at a higher temperature, they move more. So if we take a look at this little box here, this circle is some sort of like hot object. And these little lines are indicative of motion. So there are a lot of motion. There's a lot of motion in these molecules. So because there's a lot of motion, they have high thermal energy. We will note then that the molecules out here aren't really moving a lot. They're kind of still. Um, that's because they have, so they have a low thermal energy, and we would say that they are cold. Okay? So or colder than the, the hot object we've put into that. And so because you have all this high energy, what literally starts to happen is these molecules will hit and collide with the slow moving, low thermal energy molecules around them. What that will lead to is that those molecules that are around them that previously weren't moving much start to move a little bit. So you get a little bit of motions here and there. And at the same time, these molecules start to move a little bit less because they've lost some of that thermal energy. It's now the motion has been spread out among everything. So one of the things we can start to see is that heat always flows from hot to cold because heat always flows as when these motion, the motion of molecules kind of moves around. In this case, the hot object, those molecules have a lot of motion, so they're bouncing around a lot. They just collide with molecules that aren't and then make them move, right? They transfer that energy. They stop moving around as much. The surrounding molecules start to bounce around, start to move more. And so that heat always flows from hot to cold. Additionally, once you have heat transfer being done, all of your molecules will be at the same temperature. Because now everything's moving the same. You're, there's not an imbalance where some molecules are moving more and they're going to jostle more others. Um, there is still an, uh, you know, a distribution. You have some that are moving more, some that are moving less. But remember, temperature is all about average. The average motion, the average thermal energy for the, all the different molecules in the system, it doesn't matter what type of molecules, they're all going to be the same. All right, so we want to talk a little bit about energy units, make sure we're all on the same page. So our metric unit is going to be the joule, which has units of capital J. Uh, so joule, capital J, that's named after someone as a symbol, uh, is the standard unit for energy. Uh, that's not a lot of energy. Um, so oftentimes uh, we use kilojoules. It's just a metric unit, so we can put that kilo, meaning 1,000 joules. Chemical reactions usually are on the order of kilojoules of energy. Um, another unit you may be familiar with is the calorie, uh, which has the abbreviation C-A-L, cal. Um, and a calorie is defined, it's not a metric unit, but it's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So it's kind of a useful uh, measurement or common kind of standard. Um, it's equal to 4.184 joules, um, so it's also not that big. The most common application is in biology, so if you've ever dealt with energy in a biology class or anything like that, calorie is the most common measurement. 
And actually for food energy, uh, the energy in food, we talk about calories with a capital C. That capital C actually means kilo calories. So even though calorie is not technically a metric unit, people still use kilo calories to mean 1,000 calories. Um, so it's the same idea that we have there. Um, but again, you know, your body needs a lot more than, uh, you know, if you think one calorie is one gram of water by one degree Celsius, a kilocalorie is a thousand grams of water by one degree Celsius. Your body needs a lot of energy because you have a lot of water that you need to, to power up. Um, you may have be familiar with other units. Kilowatt hour is common in uh, electric electricity usage. British thermal unit or BTU is common in heat usage. Um, these are just common other units that have their own unique context. Um, they're all measuring the same thing, just different sizes. You can see one calorie is not a lot of kilowatt hours or BTUs um, in those contexts. That's why you use those bigger units. Uh, your kilowatt hours, you know, are a lot, it's a lot of energy because your household uses a lot of electricity. Okay, so uh, we've defined that. Now we want to start to talk about actual changes of how heat is flowing. We want to be able to characterize that. So we want to start by talking about heat capacity. And so heat capacity, which has the symbol of capital C, is the ratio of temperature change to energy added. So we know that when we're talking about thermal energy, that heat is flowing in. And at the end of the day, we know that the temperatures are all going to be equal to each other. But the question is, how much will the temperature change based on how much energy you put in? And it depends on what you're heating. Okay, So um, the, certain, uh, uh, the same amount of energy doesn't always cause the same change in temperature. It depends first off on what material you're heating. So for example, um, it's really easy to heat up most metals. So steel uh, in your pot um, doesn't require really much energy at all. Um, it'll get really hot really easily. But water takes a ton of energy. That's why when you put, say, an empty pot on the stove, it gets real hot really fast. But if you put water in that pot, it takes a really long time to heat up that water. Um, so it depends on what you're heating, what substance it is. It also depends on how much you have. Certainly these cast iron pots, they're the same type of cast, or cast iron pans, sorry. They're the same type of material. So cast iron, however much energy, that kind of ratio. But in this case, this is a much larger pan over here. As a result, there's just more stuff there. It's gonna be, it's gonna require more energy to increase the temperature. Because remember, temperature is the average motion of particles, or in this case, atoms in that piece of metal. And so if you have more atoms, it's gonna take more energy to get them up to that same average temperature. A smaller pan, it's just less atoms, you need less energy to get to that same average. So as a result, there's these kind of two competing factors. We want something that's a bit more specific uh, to or a bit more useful and more generally applied. So what we're going to define is the specific heat capacity. We now have our symbol that I'm going to use is a lowercase c. Uh, so lowercase c is for specific heat capacity. This is the energy to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Uh, other symbols you'll see are either this like little c, lowercase c, with an S as a subscript or a capital C with an S as a subscript, where that S stands for specific. Um, generally, that's a little old timey, a little outdated. It's just more common to see a lowercase c. Um, so specific heat is an intensive property. Um, so that means it's always, this is characteristic of a given substance. So for example, aluminum has a specific heat of 0.9 joules per gram degree Celsius. All aluminum always has that. So one, the first, the first kind of implication of that is if you want to study something about aluminum with heat flow, you can always look up these numbers. These specific heat values are just tabulated. This is just some substances. You can find them for whatever, uh, any substance, you can look them up. You can see it also depends on the phase of matter, wall, uh, ice, liquid, and steam. Uh, ice, liquid, water, and steam all have different heat capacities, specific heat capacities. Um, and so you can use whatever you want here. Um, you also note the units are joules per gram degree Celsius. We leave it as a compound unit, uh, just kind of uh, writing out everything that's in there. Joules per gram degree Celsius is going to be our standard unit for specific heats. Okay, so now that we have that, now that we've defined our specific heat capacity, what we can now do is we can specifically, or we can calculate uh, heat transferred in a process. 
um, in any process where we have a temperature change. And our equation is going to be Q is equal to MC delta T. So Q uh, is always heat. That lowercase Q is always going to correspond to heat. So that's heat transfer. Um, and then the other side, M is going to be the mass of the system, whatever is having its temperature change. C is the specific heat capacity of that material, of that substance, of that, you know, mixtures, whatever it is. And then D is change in temperature. So we're going to start to see this delta symbol. Delta, that's a Greek D. It's a capital letter D. Looks just like a triangle, though. Um, so whenever we see that triangle, it just means change. So that always means whatever variable you're looking at. So in this case, delta T, it's always going to be the final minus the initial. Um, so that's always what that delta T means. So really, even though it looks like it's one, two, three values, and it is, delta T, sometimes we just talk about delta T, but that delta T always has this kind of other interpretation of what's going on. And we'll see delta come up in other places. It always means the same thing. All right, so what we want to be able to do then is start to work through um, some work with this equation and see if we can quantify amounts of heating. Okay, so how much heat is required to raise the temperature of 10 grams of copper from 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius? Let's get this set up real quick. Okay. Forward a smidge. Okay. So, how much heat is required to raise the temperature of 10 grams of copper from 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius? So, we can see that what we want is how much heat. And whenever we see that, whenever we see heat, um, for now, the only equation we have is that Q is equal to MC delta T. We're going to develop others, though. We're going to see there's other ways to calculate heat. And so what we can really see we want to key in on is that we have temperature is involved. And whenever we want heat associated with temperature, the equation is always going to be Q is equal to MC delta T. And so we want that Q. The question is, do I have values for my other variables? And we can see M is always going to be mass. So that's 10 grams. That's OK. C, OK, I can see that this lowercase c, that is specific heat capacity. And I'm not given the specific heat capacity anywhere in the problem but I am told that it's copper. And because I see that it's copper, I can look up what the specific heat capacity is, and I can find that it's 0 0.385 joules per gram degree Celsius. So the time to that, I was pulling out of the table that we had in the last uh, little part uh, a couple slides ago, um, but we can always look that up. If you just Google like copper heat capacity, you'll get that value as well. Finally, we need the delta T. And so for the delta T, we know delta is T minus T initial. Draw like a little line here. And so we can see our temperatures. We're given both of them. That's going to be 40 degrees C minus 25 degrees C, which is equal to 15 degrees C. Perfect. So we can plug all that in. Q is equal to, what was it, 10 grams times 0 0.385 joules per gram degree Celsius times 15 degrees Celsius. So numerically, if I do 10 times 10 through 5 times 15, I get 58. And then if I take a look at those units, I can see that this is joule. I can see grams right here, and grams is in the denominator here. So those cancel. The degree Celsius is in the denominator, which cancels out with this degree Celsius. And all that I'm left with 
is joules. Which is good because I wanted heat, which is an energy measurement or an energy description. So I've gotten joules, which is an energy unit. So that's a good sign um, that I've done this work correctly, that I've gotten the correct type of unit. Okay. So let's get back into PowerPoint. So for heating up the copper, it took us 58 joules. Um, we can actually ask a similar question, right? We could ask how much heat is required to raise the temperature of 10 grams of water from 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. We can see those are the exact same numbers, right? 10 grams of water, same mass, 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. The only difference is that we're now dealing with water so that heat capacity changes. That little C, that is characteristic of it being, uh, you know, whatever material is. So it was copper last time, so it was 0.385. This time it's water, so it's 4.1. And so it ends up being a higher number. We can see that the overall heat then is going to be higher. Uh, it's over 600 joules now required to heat up water. And so this is what the heat capacity tells us. Water has a really high heat capacity, and we can see that uh, copper has a relatively low heat capacity, right? It's only 4.18, uh, it's only uh, 0.385 versus 4.184. So because water has a really high heat capacity, it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. This is why we use water to cool things, right? To do anything like that, that's why you use it when you like sweat, when you're cooling things, when you're cooking with things, because that heat capacity, that word capacity, it's a reference to how much inherent heat or how much energy is inside of it due to those temperature changes. And water is a really high heat capacity. It's one of the largest heat capacities of substances. And so it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature. And conversely, hot water has a lot of energy inside of it. Uh, there's a lot of energy that can transfer out of that into something that's colder. Metal, not so much. Uh, it doesn't really take a lot of energy to heat up a metal. All right, so you saw me work with the heat equation. Now for the participation assignment due on March 31st, question two. A 4.5 gram piece of metal, initially at 45 degrees Celsius, is placed into water, cooling the metal down to 23 degrees Celsius. If 46 joules of heat has flowed out of the metal in this process, what is the specific heat capacity of this metal? So 4.5 gram piece of metal, initially at 45 degrees Celsius, is placed into water, cooling the metal down to 23 degrees Celsius. If 146 joules of heat has flowed out of the metal in this process, what is the specific heat capacity of this metal? All right, just going to do it for our first video here. Um, week seven, we're back. We got two participation assignments again this week. So for that participation three, we've already gotten two of those questions in. Um, that's due March 31st. Um, we got the midweek assignment due Wednesday. comes after that. Um, and then we have, of course, the end of the week homework and lab uh, due uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, respectively. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I will see you later this week.